Good morning. Good morning. Um, I am Freeholder Kathy DiFilippo. Uh, I'm from Morris County and I represent our county uh, on the NJTPA Board of Trustees. I'm also proud to serve as the chair for the NJTPA. Our TPA Tuesday Symposium Series is just one part of the NJTPA's next Long Range Plan 2050, which is about transportation, people, and opportunity. Today's symposium focuses on adopting to change. I think it's fair to say that uh, change can be difficult sometimes, and this year we've all had to adopt to changes at so many different levels perhaps much faster than we ever thought. The pandemic, remote working and school, new technologies, electric vehicles, a renewed focus on equity and diversity, climate change, and a trend towards biking, walking, and open streets in many of our towns. The, um, we're adapted to all of these changes and other changes that are coming around right now. Um, part of the NJTPA's job is to think ahead and to factor in these changes when we are planning for our future transportation needs in New Jersey. We've got a full program of expert speakers today. I think you'll find their insights very thoughtful and provoking. I'm looking forward to hearing the discussion and your questions that will follow. Now I'm going to turn the program over to the NJTPA's Executive Director, Mary Amin. Good morning, Mary. Good morning. Thank you, everyone. Hopefully I'm visible and audible. Um, thank you again, uh, Freeholder DiFilippo, for helping to set the stage for, his, for today's symposium and for your introductory remarks. I'm looking forward to today's discussion on adapting to change. Uh, and as our chair indicated, this symposium series is just one part of, of the long range plan that the NJTPA is now developing. We began over a year ago with a planning for 2050 speaker series held at the NJTPA board meetings. These, uh, these discussions highlighted key issues for transportation, people, and opportunities in North Jersey. We're developing a series of background papers, um, including one that we just published on active transportation, which is about walking, biking, and other human-powered transportation. And we've certainly seen an increase in active transportation during the pandemic, and that's one, one of many changes that we'll touch on today. Um, we also have a robust public outreach effort underway. It not only features this symposium series, but it also includes virtual public meetings and an online survey. We've held four virtual outreach meetings so far and have two more this week, one tomorrow at 8 a.m. and another on Thursday at 7 p.m. Please sign up at njtpa.org slash plan 2050. You'll also find our brief survey on, the, on this website. We encourage you to fill it out and share it with your family and your friends. Uh, we'll be announcing other outreach events that are being planned later this fall and throughout the winter. We really value your input and ideas as we develop our long range plan, which our board is expected to adopt in September of 2021. Thank you again for attending our first TPA Tuesday Symposium. I know we're all e eager to get started, so I'll now turn the program over to our Manager of External Affairs, Ted Ritter. Thank you. Mary, thanks a lot. I appreciate you and the Chair, uh, Kathy DiFilippo, for setting the stage for us today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Ted Ritter. I'm with NJTPA staff. And, and as you heard from uh, Chair DiFilippo and Mary, um, this first TPA Tuesday is all part of the outreach for our Long Range Plan, Plan 2050. So. I'm especially psyched to see 75 people uh, joining us here for the first of what's gonna be three symposiums we're doing in a series. Now, during today's webinar, we've enabled Zoom's chat function to allow you to exchange ideas about what you'll soon be hearing from our keynote speaker and our expert panelists. If you've got specific uh, you know, questions you would like asked during the Q&A session, well, 
just use the Q&A function. You can also upvote questions and our moderators will relay the most commonly asked questions uh, right to our panelists during the time allotted for uh, Q&A. So we have a very strong program put together for our first TPA Tuesday. And after I uh, tee it up, we'll hear from our keynote speaker. Then we'll move into our panel discussion about adapting to change. And I think you'll agree, we have some very uh, heavy hitters and thought leaders with us today, uh, ready to enlighten us about adapting to change. After that will be the Q&A portion of the agenda, and then we'll close it out. But after today's formal agenda is complete, we invite you to stick around because we've got optional networking and an opportunity for some further discussion after the program, if you so choose, if your schedule permits, whatever. Uh, you can join this optional after party using the link provided. We're also copying it into the chat, I believe, as we speak. There we go. And so there you have it. That sort of sets us up. So right now, we are super excited to have Harriet Tregoning with us to introduce the topic of adapting to change. And she's also going to be with us for today's panel discussion too, which is pretty cool. Harriet is the director of NUMO. That's the New Urban Mobility Alliance. It's hosted by the World Resources Institute's Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. NUMO is a new collaborative effort. It's designed to guide policymakers and the private sector and even people like us toward a shared vision of cities and urban mobility. Harriet is as deeply engaged today as she has been for more than two decades now in planning, smart mobility, disaster resilience, housing, and community development issues. She's worked with organizations across this great nation to help states and communities prep for a range of future challenges, many of which we're considering in the development of our Plan 2050. Harriet served in the Obama administration as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Office of Community Planning and Development at HUD, where she initiated the first ever $1 billion National Disaster Resilience Competition. Pretty cool. Harriet studied engineering and public policy at Washington University and was a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard Graduate School of Design. I am honored to introduce Harriet Tregoni. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be with you this morning. Um, I will confess I'm a little bit of a planning nerd and I think this is a really exciting time to be thinking about a long range transportation plan. Uh, part of what I'm trying to do this morning is to give you some things to think about, perhaps a bit of a provocation, um, but this presentation is all about change. Uh, and we do know that we can't keep doing exactly what we have been doing and expect to get a lot better results in transportation. So I'm thrilled to be talking about change and adapting to it. I think we've all gained some expertise in managing change this year. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this was a meme on Twitter that I really loved, but it sort of suggests uh, uh, that it has already been a very crazy year. Trips canceled, um, work from home 24 seven for many people, kids and parents uh, running schools in their dining room, sweatpants as our daily wardrobe, uh, and certainly the novelty of Zoom has, uh, has worn off a little bit. Uh, but very seriously for many of us, this has been a year of a lot of losses uh, at every scale. Uh, nearly seven and a half million people in the US are known to have been infected with the novel coronavirus and more than 210,000 have died. Globally, we've seen 35 million people affected and more than a million who've died. Hundreds of thousands of beloved small businesses have closed. And the idea of simply seeing and hugging a friend or a family member uh, seems like a distant dream. Um, so next slide. Uh, I know a lot of us are asking, is this ever going to end? Will this ever be over? Um, that, uh, that is a great question, and it's not just been COVID. Uh, it's been the, uh, uh, the, the, the protests about uh, racial injustice. It's been um, uh, the, the pandemic-driven recession, and it's also been a huge season for natural disasters. Next slide. Um, so this presentation is about managing change, but the big disruptions uh, uh, we know are coming um, uh, really call for us to uh, adapt. I mean, we know they're headed our way. 
uh, but also make sure that resilience and that adaptability is part of what we build into our transportation system. So let's, uh, let's talk about transportation. Uh, when it comes to the disruption there, um, uh, it, it's hard to not think immediately of the COVID-related impacts on, on, on transit. In a state like New Jersey, uh, the, the most urbanized state in the, in the U.S., uh, where transit uh, is, is very widely available in North New Jersey, that, you know, th those impacts are, are substantial. Um, and think about how trends are, are around uh, delivery and online shopping have also been uh, accelerated. And we're going to talk about climate change and what the impacts are there, and also um, about uh, economic disparity. We know that uh, concerns about the growing inequality in our country uh, have only been exacerbated by the pandemic and transportation plays a big role. Uh, so let's dive right in with the next slide on transportation. Next slide. Um, new mobility is a loose term for business models that use mostly technology and data to deliver transportation in new ways. The most talked about disruptions have been reinventing ownership and delivery, uh, using data and connectivity in new ways, uh, new fuels and reimagining vehicles. Uh, and you see here some recent covers of magazines and also some of the, uh, the companies uh, that have a, a very small uh, portion of the companies that have jumped in to these new mobility services. And with the idea that in the future, we may not own uh, our transportation means, but we just might purchase the services when and how and where we need them. Uh, next slide. Um, the point here is that it's, uh, the pace of change is accelerating. Uh, it took ride hailing seven years to reach uh, almost a 40% adoption rate in US metropolitan areas. Uh, for bike sharing, it took eight years to reach 13% of metros, but e-scooters reached 10 million users in less than a year uh, and 10 billion users in less than two years. Next slide. Mobility disruptions have far-reaching impacts. The most dramatic example in the moment, as I mentioned earlier, was transit how drastically transit funding has been affected uh, by COVID as well as service. Uh, the whole notion of peak travel uh, might permanently change with a smaller morning peak and maybe no discernible peak in the afternoon at all. That's what we're currently seeing. Parking and traffic uh, enforcement revenues are down, but we also know that there's the potential for new rev revenue streams. Many cities are already managing their curb much more intently than they were before, and rethinking how we regulate some of these new services might also provide um, revenue. There are impacts on bricks and mortar stores, on, on perhaps the future land use in those places. A lot of downtowns are thinking about uh, maybe they'll have less need for commercial office buildings. What could be the new uses uh, in those places? At the same time, every day in every residential neighborhood now, we have an office building's worth of workers uh, and more at home every day. Uh, does that change how we want to think about single family residential neighborhoods? So these impacts are very far reaching. Next slide. Um, there are absolutely ways in which um, everything we care about from uh, accessibility and uh, low carbon to complete streets and safety, uh, uh, just sustainable livable cities, all of those things can get better with technology and other changes that you'll be contemplating as part of the long range transportation plan. But it's also possible that there are ways in which everything gets worse, where sprawl gets worse, where even more people drive single occupancy vehicles and pollution goes up, where streets get less safe with more speeding and more traffic, where we see historic, uh, uh, more historic job losses from automation uh, and huge drops in, in tax revenue. So it's really up to us to figure out how we get more of the things that we want and fewer of the things that we don't want and really articulating those things in the long range plan. It's also true that the pandemic 
is accelerating changes and making things more uncertain. Uh, uh, more than 40% of the U.S. workforce is now working from home, uh, and we're seeing big increases in bicycle purchase and use, and obviously huge decreases in transit use, more people driving alone. So how do we know what is the new normal? Next slide. It's important that we not let ourselves be distracted, uh, if you can do the next slide, uh, especially by technology, right? There's so much talk about, here's our new technology, let's use it everywhere, um, and not even answer the question, is it actually needed? Is it actually a good thing to use this new, uh, whatever the new technology might be? Let's really think instead about what it is that we want and need. And, and not forget this particular uh, lesson, next slide, is that uh, transportation is really um, a band-aid on poor land use. There was a time for most of human history, for the first 6,000 years of human history in, in, in settlements, uh, in actual uh, places where people lived, where proximity was enormously valued. Uh, but at the beginning of the last century, uh, uh, click it for me. Uh, automobility really became uh, something that we used in place of proximity, in place of that kind of convenience. Um, and there are ways that we can become less reliant on transportation uh, if we uh, think more about how we put the things that we need together. And technology is helping us do that, work from home just being one example. Um, that there are a lot of things that we can now do without ever having to use transportation. So how do we think about these things all together? Um, next slide. We've seen in this crisis that our current transportation system has some big holes. Think of who we are calling critical workers during COVID and how they are um, having difficulty, these workers getting to their jobs, especially with the disruption of some transit service. Well, many of these workers are critical, not just during uh, the, this pandemic, but also critical every day. So for many, transportation is actually part of the problem. By the same token, we know that transportation is mutable. It's, it has changed, it will change, uh, and, it, and it could be deployed to help us solve many of the problems that we face. Next slide. One of those big problems is climate change. All across the country, communities are facing significant risk from extreme weather like heat waves, tropical storms, high winds, heavy downpours, simply heavy, heavy rain. In many places, these risks are projected to increase substantially because of sea level rise, climate change, and changing development patterns, especially along, uh, along the coast. Um, we're realizing how vulnerable we are, not just to the damage bought, brought on by these events, but to the long process of economic rebuilding that comes with recovery. Um, I know that uh, many places are still uh, recovering from uh, Superstorm Sandy. Um, and that, uh, you know, that, 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 that seems like, uh, uh, you know, just the worst thing that could ever happen. But uh, every year we're setting new records in terms of weather uh, extreme weather, and, uh, and I'm afraid that the worst is, is still to come. Next slide. Uh, disasters in the making are not simply things like uh, flooding and, and, and droughts and violent storms, but honestly, uh, prolonged periods of elevated temperature is the most certain effect of a predicted climate change, and heat can be a real killer. Um, you know, in, in the 1990s, People were shocked when a heat wave in Chicago led to the death of nearly 800 people. Uh, heat and humidity can affect the ability of people to work out of doors. Um, if the sort of temperature projected for the end of the century uh, were to happen today, outdoor workers would lose about 30 working hours per year, uh, which has huge effects on what can be done for transportation and other infrastructure. Next slide. Uh, this is the worst fire season ever. Um, I think in some ways this picture encapsulates 2020, right? Um, it's a, it's a, uh, a nursing home with a, with a sign asking people to wash their hands and wear a mask, uh, utterly engulfed in uh, a raging wildfire. Next slide. 
It's also one of the worst hurricane seasons ever. You're familiar with devastating storms, but 2020 is, a, is shaping up to be a record-breaking season. Um, extremely active uh, season with 19 to 25 named storms predicted, including up to 11 hurricanes. Uh, the worst Atlantic hurricane season in 170 years. And I feel like we just have to keep getting used to hearing the worst ever. Uh, next slide. And we need to feel urgent about the changing climate, not, you know, not just because of the effects it's having, although those are dreadful, but we have to acknowledge in particular that the role uh, transportation is playing is, 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 is frightening. Almost every other sector is reducing its emissions, but transportation is now the largest uh, uh, greenhouse gas emitting sector in the U.S., and it is still growing. So the, the urgency we feel is, uh, is, is critical. And let's, let's also add on the next slide that, we're, that, that there's a lot of opportunity for us to do better because uh, our transportation system is frankly remarkably inefficient. Cars are used less than 5% of the time and parked 95% of the time. That's why there's been so much disruption um, because car ownership doesn't seem like a great deal to, uh, to a lot of people. Uh, we use six to nine parking spaces for each and every automobile in the U.S. Um, so that's a lot of land given over to car storage. And, and think about it, other than your house, it's the, it's the largest purchase. Uh, and for many households, the largest purchase they will ever make. Uh, so that's why so many technology-based disruptions are happening. Next slide. So what can planners do in the face of all this change in transportation itself? Is, is think about changing how people travel for certain trips. Um, more than half of travel is for distances less than three miles. Uh, we could flip those trips to walk, bike, or scooter modes uh, so that people could travel safely, cheaply, quickly, including the third of the population that doesn't have a driver's license or a car. Again, th uh, next slide, uh, three miles, why three miles? because 52%, as you'll see on the next slide, of trips in the U.S. are shorter than, than three miles. Uh, next slide. And not just that, but of those shorter trips, currently we make 73% of those trips by car. In fact, uh, even for trips less than one mile, more than 60% of those trips are taken by automobile. Now, when we talk about efficiency, you know, is a two-ton vehicle the best way to take a, a half-mile trip? You know, probably not. Uh, maybe in some cases you could make an argument, but not for 60% of trips. Um, so next slide. If we shifted those trips to shared and active modes, for example, um, you know, we could make incredible progress, enough for some households in New Jersey to perhaps have one less car. Uh, next slide. What has to change to, to flip those trips? We have to think about physical infrastructure. We're already seeing cities, counties, townships allocate the streets uh, somewhat differently, uh, often for outdoor dining, but also for curb delivery and for bike lanes. Um, we need people, vehicles, and, and goods to think about how uh, services get delivered in a different way. We also need to uh, make it more normative to take short trips by other modes. And businesses and markets um, need to also think about pricing and, and labor you know, in a different way. What if uh, for all the last miles uh, we, we had in the US what they have in Europe, which is uh, UPS delivery by cargo bike? Next slide. The other thing for us to think about is the growing disparity that we're seeing uh, across the country. Next slide. Um, this has been a real moment of reckoning uh, during COVID with systemic uh, injustices, racial injustices being exacerbated, particularly concerning black people and communities. Uh, these are questions that are being raised that should all give us uh, a moment of pause and, and and, and should really force us to listen and learn. Um, are our policies and practices moving us towards or away from 
more equitable and inclusive cities. Next slide. Um, in New Jersey, uh, one of the wealthiest states in the US, um, average income is very high, the third highest, I believe, in the country. Um, but there are enormous disparities, um, even in New Jersey, with one in 10 uh, uh, residents living below the poverty line, one in seven children living in poverty, and one in 10 uh, New Jersey residents receiving government aid. Next slide. But vulnerability isn't just about income. According to the CDC, there are several components, including transportation. Um, so socioeconomic status, household comp uh, composition and disability, uh, proficiency with language, whether, you're, uh, 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 whether you have minority status, uh, perceived as a minority, uh, you know, whether you have a vehicle, what and how you travel. These are all components of social vulnerability. Next slide. In New Jersey, um, the mapping in the greater uh, New York area, including northern New Jersey, shows the population um, uh, that's vulnerable in red relative to the entire population. And while New York City has a, a larger uh, share of vulnerable residents compared to Long Island, Hudson Valley, and southwestern Connecticut, northern New Jersey has the second highest number. Um, next slide. And if you map it, you can see where that social vulnerability is concentrated in, in red. Um, so, you know, the geography. Um, is, uh, is, is critical, and I'll have some more points to make about that in a moment. Next slide. COVID has certainly exacerbated the disparities uh, that we've seen, particularly when it comes to job losses. Um, women, in particular, um, are leaving the workforce in droves, uh, but Black women, in particular, uh, are, are seeing this effect. And these graphics show the, the 1990 recession, the 2001 recession, the 2008 recession, and then the corona crisis. And you can see how incredible um, the, the lowest earning uh, cohorts uh, have been affected. And that makes sense if you think about, next slide, where the job losses are located. They're mostly in, uh, in retail, food and beverage service, tourism and leisure, support services, education, uh, et cetera. So the, again, the red bars are low wage jobs versus high wage jobs. Um, I mean, even looking at who has the luxury of being able to work from home, uh, it's, it's, it's quite a stark difference. A lot of people have to show up to their jobs risking um, uh, the possibility of contracting the coronavirus, but also having to spend money uh, and time on transportation uh, where transit service isn't available, it's finding another way. It might be you know, going into debt to purchase a car when before you were able to rely on transit or other means. Uh, and for high wage workers who can much more easily work from home, what we're seeing is uh, in some ways their wealth is increasing. They're not having to commute. Their stock portfolios are looking good. Uh, they, they call this a K-shaped recovery because it's really unlike anything that we've seen in terms of uh, the, the, the way it's increasing the disparities in our country. Next slide. Um, so I pulled a couple of uh, graphics to uh, from uh, the Housing and Transportation Index for the Center for Neighborhood Technology. Just to show you, uh, within northern New Jersey, Hudson County and Somerset County, um, how, how very different uh, these, uh, uh, these, these, these places look. Traditional measures of housing affordability ignore transportation costs. Typically, uh, a household's second largest expenditure is transportation. And transportation costs are a function of the characteristics of a neighborhood that a household chooses to, uh, to live in. Location matters. Compact neighborhoods with walkable streets and high access to jobs and transit are more efficient, more affordable, and more sustainable. So uh, for example, in Hudson County, 
uh, households on average are spending only $7,000 a year on transportation costs, and they're spending almost twice that much uh, in, in Somerset County. Uh, in, in Hudson County, you're, uh, there's households own an average of one car per household, it's 1.9 cars per household practically in Somerset. Um, and the average uh, vehicle travel is only 8,000 miles in Hudson, and it's 22,000 miles in, uh, uh, in, in, in Somerset County. And if you look at the pie chart, the blue is disposable income after paying housing and transportation costs. And look how much more disposable income there is on average in Hudson, New Jersey, mostly because of their pattern of land use. So I would just say that when you think about a, a crisis and you think about adaptability and the ability to weather a crisis, uh, having uh, some cushion is really important. Uh, I'll just mention that when I was the planning director in DC during the 2008 recession, hundreds of cars began to drop off our DMV rolls. I thought, people were fleeing the jurisdiction. But what they were doing was dialing down their transportation costs because they could. Um, they were, um, they were, they were uh, two car households became one car households. One car households became no car households. I'm sure people thought just temporarily, but a lot of those changes end up being permanent. And even in the same jobs and housing market overall, uh, that Washington, uh, uh, in the Washington metropolitan area, uh, the inner ring jurisdictions, especially D.C., saw almost no foreclosure or bankruptcy, uh, whereas we still have parts of our region that have not recovered the pre-2008 housing prices. So those inner ring jurisdictions didn't just have a, 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 a better time, uh, you know, less severe recession. They also bounced back much more quickly. And that's the kind of resilience I think we want for all of our communities. Next. Um, slide, uh, because uh, one of the biggest things that is going to determine whether or not uh, we come out of 2020 very well and whether we continue to prosper in New Jersey and elsewhere is, is whether or not uh, we can meet our daily needs with transportation, uh, whether we can get to jobs, whether we can get to health care, whether we can get to groceries, and whether we're serving uh, transit-dependent individuals, low-income individuals, people of color, older adults, people with disabilities. Um, access requires infrastructure, and we have to think about how we invest to meet people's daily needs. Next slide. The biggest issue is going to be for our recovery post-COVID and in the future is access to jobs. And New York is one of the most, is the most transit-accessible place uh, in the entire United States, but the 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 the, uh, the colors on the map uh, and the intensity of those colors indicate how um, how easily people can access jobs within a 45 minute time window. So that's by transit in the upper slide, which is pretty darn good. But look at how many more jobs can be accessed in 45 minutes by automobile. Um, that's because we have largely let businesses locate wherever they want, and they want to locate where land is cheap. And then they turn around and say to uh, the TPA, hey, we need transportation investments to serve these far-flung areas because that's where the jobs now are, as opposed to saying we want to co-locate jobs and transit, and we want to create uh, a system where that is the, that's de facto what happens. Uh, next slide. Um, changing, um, maybe we need to change our rationale about how and why we invest in infrastructure. We focus now on uh, speeding the movement of vehicles and reducing auto congestion. If there were two things that our transportation investments concentrate on right now, those are the things. We are virtually uh, indifferent uh, to whether or not we are actually uh, serving people, uh, not just metal boxes, but are we serving people? Are people getting access? Um, you know, it, we've built a transportation system and operated it for a hundred years without a great idea of what success looks like. 
Um, and many people are finding a system built on, on increasing speed and reducing auto congestion is leaving them out. Next slide. So what if, um, you know, we thought about our transportation system differently? What if North New Jersey uh, uh, stopped talking about level of service when it came to transportation? But next slide. Instead, focused on uh, providing universal access. What if everybody had access? Next slide. What would it really uh, require of us to get there? So that's what I'm going to leave you with, and uh, I look forward to being part of the panel coming up. Thank you so much for your time and attention. Thank you, Harriet. I am going, I'm going to first put my video on so you all can see me. Um, we are going to, in one, in a couple of seconds, move into uh, a panel discussion. Uh, we have a great panel today with some names you know, and um, some you may not. Uh, that is one of the positive things about going virtual. We can more easily pull together experts from across the country. Um, to, to make sure we have ample time for discussion, I'm not going to read everybody's bios. Uh, Christina is adding a link to the bios in the chat box now if you'd like to check out our panelists' uh, impressive backgrounds. Um, so in one second, we are going to bring everybody, we're going to go into a Brady Bunch review, if you will. Today we have Nat Bodinger, who is the New Jersey Director of the Regional Plan Association, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Lowe, who is an associate professor at Texas Southern, and he's also a distinguished visiting professor, uh, he, he can say it better, um, at uh, CUNY this year. Um, Harriet is going to stay with us, who's the director of NUMO. Um, Ann Forsyth is the director of the Harvard U University Urban Planning Program, and she's also the editor of the Journal of the American Planning Association. Uh, finally, we have Sam Schwartz, uh, a well-known name around here. He's CEO and co-founder of Sam Schwartz Transportation Consultants. So with that, I'm going to stop sharing our screen and go into um, gallery view. And Nat, if you could uh, pull up your video too so we can see you. Great. So welcome. That was uh, a great intro to our topic here. Um, we're going to do an opener uh, for, for everybody on the panel. Um, what have we learned uh, from COVID that is true now um, that will be even more true in 10 years? And what do we think won't be true in 10 years? Um, anyone want to volunteer to go first? Okay, I'm going to call on someone. Anne. Happy to do it. And I'm uh, an expert in health and planning, so I thought I'd take an e a health angle here. So what's true now and will still be true is that health is important in transportation, and it's everything from accident prevention to improving air quality to, to making sure people can access services they need to live a healthy life, emergency services, active transport and so on. And in COVID-19, we've seen how things like open streets are very popular and those sort of easy, relatively easier changes, I think will stick around. Uh, what is true now and may not be so true in the future is the exact um, effects of infectious disease, which is front and center now and affecting transportation both uh, increasing some forms and decreasing others, as Harriet said. Um, and there will definitely be more infectious uh, disease pandemics or at least potential pandemics in the next 10 years. But I'm hoping that we respond a bit differently and better in the future. And from that, I, and I, I say that because when you look at the, the places that had SARS and MERS earlier, uh, places like Taiwan, Hong Kong and Singapore, They've generally done better, they responded differently, their transit systems are still uh, going on. So what I hope we don't do is try to prepare for the last pandemic in transportation, but prepare for the next pandemic, which I think will be a little different, even though health will still be important. Thank you, Anne. Uh, Jeffrey, would you like to chime in? Sure, thank you, Courtney. 
I agree wholeheartedly with what Anne said, and I, I really appreciate what uh, what Harriet uh, mentioned in her uh, presentation, opening us, uh, opening opening up this conversation um, here. I, I do think that um, we have to continue to focus on, um, you know, the long-term goal of keeping the uh, focus really on uh, how do we, you know, maintain access and, uh, in terms of transportation, you know, to all, and, and, and what that means in terms of ensuring safety uh, as well. I think many of our uh, transportation systems, and especially I think our, our surface um, transportation uh, may in fact move more uh, towards um, active uh, transportation mechanisms. How that, what that looks like in different regions, um, I think um, really matters, especially for those who live in places where they may not necessarily have that access and, and in less dense places. So I think that really, uh, you know, deserves um, a lot of attention. Great, Sam. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to deal with where we are right now and many of the misconceptions uh, that we have because that leads to mistakes. Uh, we just completed a report from the American Public Transit Association in uh, which we interviewed virologists, epidemiologists, reviewed the sci scientific literature and found virtually no outbreaks in transit, even in places where transit is now up to 50 to 80 percent and it is fairly crowded. But in the United States, transit is basically in the minus 70 to minus 90 percent range. And what we see is the continuation of this myth that transit is the great spreader of the virus. And that began in March and April and in the US because New York region was hit the hardest. We have the most transit, so blame transit on it. When in fact, that was not the case. Uh, we found areas, in fact, the suburbs of New York City had higher outbreaks and rates of outbreaks than New York City. So some, something was wrong there. These were works that were done often by economists, people who just looked at some correlations on it, but it's the equivalent of saying ice cream causes drownings because they both peak in the summer. So we did this fairly exhaustive research, found that if people are wearing masks, uh, that outbreaks in transit are pretty rare. But that is, that is a fear that is leading for us to make many changes that we may not have to make for the long term uh, if we take the more scientific approach here. I think it's terrific that we see more people uh, that are gonna be using the streets through active transportation, uh, using streets for outdoor restaurants, but we have this conundrum that more people will wanna use those streets for driving. They'll either be people who are formerly transit riders, people that were carpoolers, uh, or people that may have taken long-term, long distance trips and are now doing those in cars as opposed to rail or air. So we've got this conundrum in front of us and, and I think Harriet laid it out really, you know, very well. She called it hell and heaven. I've been calling it the good, the bad, the ugly. Um, you know, as Yogi Berra said, it's hard to make predictions, especially about the future. We've got choices right now and that's for NJTPA and other areas to make the choice. And I think the right choice right now is the choice to throw out levels of service to base it based on people and what people needs and, and also on equity. And we've done a terrible job on that as Harriet pointed out. Great, thank you, Sam. Nat, would you like to chime in? Sure, I wanted to add one, uh, one bit to what Anne remarked about the connection between public health and transportation. I just, uh, I, and I think it's implied in what she said, but I just wanted to make it explicit. I mean, there's a growing body of literature um, of social determinants of health, that 80% of health outcomes uh, are a result not of direct uh, healthcare access uh, features, but of ambient features in people's lives. 
And you know, the, the, the way that people have access to the transportation system adds to that in terms of uh, the stress that people feel in their lives. I mean, if it takes you uh, longer to take the bus to get to work within Newark, and it takes, you know, compared to somebody who's driving from the suburbs, uh, you know, and there, you have kids you have to take care of, you have jobs you have to get to. I mean, there's just a level of stress that people uh, live with that is, uh, contributes to health outcomes that has its starting point with the fact that it's more difficult and takes longer to get to, 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 to all the things in a person's daily life uh, that, that they need to get to. Uh, so that's just sort of one, I, I think that one thing that's gonna continue to be important is to, is to strengthen the connection between people who are practitioners of the technical art of transportation analysis and people who are looking at public health. At public health I think those two uh, don't connect as much as they as much as they should. Um, another thing that I, I think is going to be true, and I'm now kind of uh, going off of a comment that that, that Sam made about uh, myths and wrong ideas. Uh, you know, there are just a tremendous amount of sort of shibboleths in, in in transportation. You know, you'll often find people saying, "Oh, nobody bikes," and what they mean is nobody I know bikes or I don't bike. But if you look I mean, in, 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 in my suburban community, the number of Latino service workers who are biking is, you know, it, it's just regular. They're on, they're on the street all the time. This is the way they get to work. And, it, and so there's, you know, a, a bias in the way that people think about uh, their situation that, that, that reflects a set of norms about what's the right way uh, to handle mobility uh, challenges. And there's, you know, there's lots and lots of ideas like this, like cars are liberating. And that is a sort of a, a, a norm and an idea that informs all of the dynamics of where jobs went and where we invested in, in, in road networks um, that led to spatial mismatches between where people are and where jobs are. Um, uh, but, you know, as Harriet pointed out, for some people, cars are, uh, are not liberating, they're a chain. Um, uh, either for cost uh, or because they don't have access to them. Um, and for a large number of people, being in a bikeable, walkable, transit accessible place is, is the true liberty. Um, and finally, just on the, that idea of, of, of sort of myths, I mean, right now what people are saying about transit is that, you know, nobody's taking transit now. It falls into the same kind of uh, category, uh, it's true. Intercity uh, bus and intercity rail in New Jersey Transit is still at about 20% of uh, its pre-COVID uh, ridership levels, but it's 70% for a local bus, and um, you know that ridership has come back, back, and again for the reasons that others have mentioned that um, that, that what will be true, what we learn in COVID, and what uh, and, and what will be true in the future is that some people will be uh, able to to work from home. They'll be, have flexibility about where they can work. And, and, and there's a much larger number of people who, who don't have that flexibility. Um, they have to be someplace. Um, and those, that population often has less access to automobiles and depends more on the transit system. Thank you, Nat. Harriet, would you like to chime in here? Sure. Um, well, I, I would say that uh, one of the things that's true now uh, and that will be true is that our eyes really are, I think, opened on access and who gets access and who doesn't have it. Um, and, and, and that, I think, is going to continue to be uh, an issue. And I would say that, that one of the other things that we're finding is that um, uh, we are still having a difficulty as a country translating this notion of access uh, as a uh, as something that should be a public investment. Uh, it, the, the, the right of way, the road, that we totally get, but electronic access, we're thinking, oh, that's a privately provided good, not a publicly provided good. And yet look at how it's affecting uh, the school experience, right? So I really think that uh, uh, this is an area that is true now and in the future, you know, I would say this is something that our transportation agencies are best able uh, to take on. And because there's a direct relationship between the diminished need for physical mobility, if there's increased access, 
uh, that it makes total sense for one agency to kind of be doing both of these things. And a lot of the infrastructure can be put in together, uh, broadband and, uh, and, uh, uh, and roads, right? Any repairs to streets. So that's going to continue to be true. What's not going to be true, others have said, is you know, transit isn't dead. We still need ways of moving masses of people. Uh, and that uh, transit is uh, suffering right now, but uh, I think it will um, uh, it will not only make a, a full comeback, but that uh, that more people will be using it in the future. Uh, we have found in some of our own research in uh, around the world uh, exactly what Sam uh, was talking about. Sam Schwartz was talking about, which is that um, the rates of infection. Uh, are, are negligible, non-existent from transit as a, as a cause uh, because of the great air recirculation, the great air refreshment that you have on, uh, uh, on transit relative to a grocery store or an office building or an apartment uh, or hotel. So, uh, so people have a very uh, wrong idea about the real risks that uh, transit presents. So that will change. Thank you, Harriet. Um, now let's uh, shift to talking about balance. Um, we have even more users than ever com competing for the same space um, and new technology will continue to complicate that system. Um, you know, 20 years ago, we were primarily talking about commuter versus truck traffic. Uh, now we're seeing greater emphasis on bike ped usage, um, add in micro mobility, ride hailing, autonomous vehicles, new and emerging delivery modes. Um, the list really goes on and on. Um, we're certainly going through some growing pains right now. Um, how do we plan to accommodate these disparate uses safely, fairly, and efficiently? And we're going to um, bump to Sam first. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Courtney. Um, I've been at this for a half century now, having started with the old city traffic department in New York um, uh, half, uh, 50 years ago. Before that, I was a New York City cab driver. Uh, back in those days, we only counted four things, cars, taxis, buses, and trucks. The past decade, I, I've never seen anything like it, starting out with Uber and Lyft and Via and Juno and Ghetto, uh, um, Get, uh, and now we have um, e-bikes, we have bike share, you've got car share, and on, on the horizon and scooters, and on the horizon, uh, we have autonomous vehicles. And it's really incumbent upon uh, entities, local entities, to be in control of their streets and decide what their streets uh, should look like. Before, I didn't just casually say throw out level of service. Let's look back in history. If we go back 120 years ago, the pedestrian pretty much owned the right of way. And then what we did is soon we squeezed them out uh, we even made it a crime for people to do what they did for 6,000 years, walk in any path that they wanted to take. Uh, we sh shined lights in their face, a red light, and you had to stop. Crazy stuff happened. We saw uh, a huge number of people killed during that period and continue to be killed on our roadways. Let's take this moment to seize, particularly our local streets. And our local streets should be places where we change the hierarchy, where the pedestrian is king and queen, where active transportation, uh, bicycling, whether it's, it's e-bikes or scooters, also have a place there. So often I hear that it's too dangerous for scooters, it's too dangerous for bikes, too dangerous for pedestrians. That's because of the way we have a, a, a allowed cars to run free. So we really need to redefine our street space dramatically. If you go to Europe, it is not a, un, unusual to see uh, something I, I call a, a Wunderf, where streets are shared with pedestrians and bike riders and others, and everybody moves at a slow speed. And some of it is accomplished through habit, but also through design. For example, in, in Barcelona, they often make the lanes seven feet wide where here we go for 11 or 12 foot wide lanes. Why do they go for seven foot wide? Because people then drive much more slowly. So through design, we can recapture a lot of our street space, widen it for pedestrians, add bike lanes, bus lanes, change the whole nature and make it safe for all. Great, 
Thank you, Sam. Anne, can you add in here? Well, you know, Sam's such an expert, he's a hard act to follow. But I thought my contribution might be to add in a sort of health discussion. And here, the issue of health sort of varies dramatically with population. So I thought I'd target in on aging, uh, uh, on the older population, who themselves are very diverse. So then I thought I might think about um, those who are disabled, the sort of the older group with disabilities. And uh, even though as a proportion they may decrease, you know, we're getting a bit healthier, the numbers will increase because the older population is increasing so dramatically. So I'm just imagining how this will work out with like 20 different transportation modes um, kind of vying for um, a place in the, in the urban environment. So I'm thinking they try to walk in a center city area and they'd potentially be facing crowded pedestrian spaces with other pedestrians, but also cyclists and delivery robots and scooters. It may be a nirvana of open streets, but it could also be a, a sort of a fearful environment that stops people going out and about if there isn't uh, the kinds of design um, abilities or, or characteristics that Sam's talked about. In suburban areas um, that are sort of less congested, you know, it could be a nirvana if autonomous vehicles help people uh, drive a bit longer. But when they get very frail, it gets harder to get in and out of a car. And so even shared rides may for a while be of assistance, but maybe not. And they're expensive. So there's an income issue without really working on that. Although as an aside, my mum in rural Australia had a great time with the taxi system, which was heavily subsidized for rural Australians. But anyway, it's going to be a big market that uh, for autonomous vehicles and shared rides, but it may not help all the older people in suburban areas. And actually most older people live in rural um, and suburban areas and not in core areas. And then transit outside the major corridors is still going to be a challenge. Um, you know, there are some other plus sides like delivery, but I think from a health perspective, um, you know, I just speculated a lot. But the big idea is that there are a lot of different demographic groups with particular health needs that are increasing in number and importance. And it's really important to play out this future for specific groups and not just a generic person who's often like us, but um, you know, healthy and able to get around. So the, th uh, the important thing is to really focus on these um, health needs. And I could have talked about uh, children, people with low incomes and disabilities and so on, but just play out all those populations. Thank you, Anne. Um, Jeffrey Nat, or Harriet, you wanna chime in, respond to anything you've heard? I, I, I do. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to add, I guess, I guess one prediction and one need is, uh, you know, so many of these, you know, there's a, there's a tendency in transportation to think about these as sort of technical issues, but when they're often political issues um, and the, the, the people who are representing a car constituency are, you know, represent a political constituency of one type. Um, and, um, you know, I think we have to think about how people, how different classes of people get to express their views. And I think if there's one silver lining of the pandemic, it's that um, local governments and public agencies have begun to experiment with more uh, types, uh, more, more methods of getting public input. And this is, I think, opened up, it's this is my suburban uh, setting, um, voices of people who traditionally haven't been able to, 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 to contribute. And uh, I think it's one of the reasons why um, we've actually adopted a couple of very progressive ex, uh, auxiliary dwelling unit uh, ordinances here in, over the summer that supporters, many of whom are younger, who have kids who don't have uh, the ability to, to get out to public meetings have been able to um, have been able to express themselves in those public meetings. That does raise the, you know, elevate the importance again of sort of the, the, uh, digital access and of creating um, accessibility to the public meetings that are necessary for people to express all the different views on what we need in the transportation system um, to meet everybody's needs. Um, and that means, you know, we, I think we should take, we're gonna have to make available 
and make comfortable uh, access, uh, not just in the transportation network, but also to the public meetings where all of these political uh, debates are going to play out. Thanks, Matt. Jeffrey, I saw you unmuted yourself. Uh, yes, I, you know, I think, uh, and I too, I like what uh, Nat and Sam and Anne have already offered. Um, and, and going back to what Harriet uh, mentioned, where the average trip is approximately three miles, I believe uh, she mentioned. And, and, you know, I wonder, this is more of a speculation or question, uh, as we think uh, long term and, and with the desire, you know, for um, uh, residents uh, and populations to take control of their local streets. You know, I, I really see design becoming really more important in how we prioritize, uh, say, autonomous vehicles or active transportation or more traditional roles, how those resources be uh, become uh, or are doled out, uh, if you will, to, to reimagine how we design our places um, long-term, I think it's going to be really important. Thank you, Jeffrey. Harriet, did you want to add anything here? Shall we? No, go, go okay. ahead. Great. Um, next, uh, you know, government institutions and the planning field seem to finally be coming uh, to a reckoning with past practices that institutionalize racism and perpetuated segregation. Um, the public is also coming to grips with this concept as seen by, you know, the rallies and protests across the country. Really, people are demanding change. Um, a few questions along this line of thought. Um, one, what does an inequitable transportation system mean to our residents and workers? Um, and then let's flip our, our adapting to change approach on its head. How do we as planners make change? Uh, what should we be doing to guarantee equitable access to transportation? Are there best practices you're seeing from across the country? And um, we're going to toss to Jeffrey first on this. Yeah, thanks uh, so much, Courtney, for that, for this question. And I really believe that the current movement uh, for Black Lives has served as a perfect backdrop for us to really have a conversation around uh, rethinking transportation to be in a way in a manner that it can be more equitable um, when i was uh gave you know a lot of thought about uh today it kind of reminded me of a essay that was written some years ago by darnell moore who has been at the vanguard of the um, black lives matter movement uh, in an essay he entitled uh, Urban Spaces and the Mattering of Black Lives. Um, and there he says, a just city is a space where one's hue, flesh, does not determine one's full or limited access to equity and safety in communities where he or she lives, works, or plays. And so I think fundamentally what he's saying here is that our approaches, um, and I include transportation here, uh, plays a key role in dismantling, um, you know, white supremacy or this notion that uh, white significance uh, of an individual who's white, they have more significance uh, than, than those persons of a darker hue um, that may be seen um, as as worthlessness. And so we're, I think we're getting to raising this question in terms of if we look at transportation as uh, providing more equitable um, centers and meeting needs, uh, how do we dismantle that in a material way that makes sure, uh, that ensures that everyone uh, can have access uh, uh, to transportation? Uh, particularly those who have fewer options. And so expanding the dialogue seems to be really important in flipping the script, if you will, expanding the dialogue that uh, ensures that people in neighborhoods and on the streets are involved in making their, their places uh, uh, better. 
Now, a recent um, transportation cooperative research uh, program report about um, equity analysis uh, in regional transportation concluded that some regional transportation authorities have identified the current needs of underserved populations, but few have connected those findings um, to potential uh, future disparities and or even uh, mitigating those uh, disparities. So I think what ends up is what we, after having you know, greater dialogues, uh, what we learn and uh, what we know uh, very little um, about those um, about what we know or what we learn uh, ends up in plans that brings about greater equity um, for um, the mattering of, of black lives uh, and those who are really faced with um, inequities so so in order to flip this script and getting planning, planners more engaged, we really must determine ways, I think, to, dis, to demystify, if you will, our um, transit and provide more explicit um, implementations around how transportation systems can deliver and actually sustain uh, equity. Thank you, Jeffrey. Nat, I know you've uh, been doing a little research on this as well. Yeah, and I, I, I just wanted to, uh, to, to, uh, I guess, double down on the, uh, on the reference that Jeffrey made to the, the report on equity analysis. I mean, I think one, one thing to start with is knowing what the standard is for, for doing equity analysis. And a, the report uh, that Jeffrey's talking about, published this summer by the Transit Cooperative Research Program, uh, is called Equity Analysis in Regional Transportation Planning. And uh, it, 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 it gives a very clear accounting of what uh, the state of the art is and how few regional transportation planning agencies actually go through all of the five steps that you need to go through. Um, and so I think, you know, to, 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 to step from, and I would recommend it to everybody, basically. I mean, I think it's a great resource document um, to, to show where, where we are and where we need to get to. Um, but in terms of how, how, we, how we make progress, I mean, some of the, uh, I think the, one of the things to do is that planners are going to need to take risks and do things that are uncomfortable. I think that, you know, uh, regional, transportation planning agencies have a set of tools and capabilities um, and tasks that they're very comfortable with, um, but they have been adapted primarily to, um, to auto movement uh, kind of tasks over the past. And I know NJTPA has been making a lot of uh, strides in, in, in getting more diverse in the way that uh, they use those tools. But, you know, fundamentally, uh, the, the the main opportunity of the of, of the MPO is, and NGTPA is to frame issues and to communicate information um, and to make it clear what the challenges are uh, that the region has to meet, even if the MPO on its own and the and the state DOT on its own doesn't have all the tools that are needed in order to make progress. But uh, they can call they can call the question um, and you know, so many of the things that affect uh, regional transportation system equity, like uh, where businesses locate, where homes are, are permitted to be built, where institutions grow, uh, how state economic development agencies, uh, you know, where in the state job growth is encouraged. All those things are, 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 are out of the MPO's control, but there's no reason that all of those institutions and organizations um, should be uh, unaware of what the consequences are and what the context is for the decisions that they're making. So um, I think uh, expanding the set of analytical tools that, that, they, uh, that they use is really important and, um, and taking risks to do analyses that, you know, uh, may uncover inequities and 
uglinesses that you know we might be embarrassed to uncover. I mean, that's that's that you know that's a major reason that a lot of uh, transportation agencies don't release data that's needed to be out there because it, you know, it, uh, because they're worried that the standard of analysis or the standard of judgment of their data is whether it's going to be perfect or not, and when having the data out there would actually make it easier for them to solve the, the problems that they're trying to address. So, you know, circling back to the, to the answer, expanding the kind of analytical tools that are used, taking risks in using those new tools, and taking risks in terms of taking on studies where you don't really know what the outcomes are, uh, and, 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 and viewing getting to the truth about how the system is working is being uh, worth it, <laughs> worth it to do, important to do. Thank you, Nat. Uh, uh, Sam, Anne, or Harriet, want to chime in here? Uh, okay. I would just... Go ahead, Go Sam. ahead, Harriet. Um, I was just going to say that, uh, uh, you know, this is a really interesting moment and, and, uh, you know, a lot of the folks in the panel have have talked about about access and equity and how we could do a lot better. Uh, Sam mentioned level of service, uh, which isn't a standard that the federal government makes uh, state transportation agencies apply or MTOs apply. You can decide whether to use level of service to make investment decisions or not. Um, there are more than half a dozen states now that use access as a measure. Uh, it's, for many of them, it's not their primary measure, it is a measure. Uh, but imagine if uh, the MPO really went all in on access and really tried to do what Nat said and, and examine, you know, who is getting access and who isn't and how much more workforce participation there could be, how much more inclusion there could be if access uh, was what, what you measured in transportation instead of uh, level of service, which, you know, uh, if, if you ask me, the places that have uh, no uh, traffic uh, at intersections, you know, are places with uh, a terrible economies. It's really hard to have level of service A and a great economy. Um, so, you know, it's a weird standard that we adopted to begin with, and we've wasted billions of dollars chasing this chimera uh, of, of a traffic-free intersection when it, it, it it doesn't, you know, it doesn't add anything to the economy to, to have this huge road. In fact, it detracts and, and, the, and the congestion always returns. You know, maybe there's a better set of investments North New Jersey could be making. Thank you, Harriet. Sam. Yeah, just following up on, on what Harriet said, uh, I think we should change the names of our departments of transportation to departments of accessibility because the goal really is accessibility. And in fact, in some European cities, they are changing it and moving it away from the name of the Department of Transportation. But I like to deal with, uh, you know, Jeffrey talked about that there's been, you know, much more dialogue of late uh, about equity, but little action, little done to mitigate that. And I think it partly because we have departments of transportation that are highway agencies. And I know we're talking to a planning group. My background is as a highway engineer, traffic engineer, and uh, we don't, uh, you know, as a, as a group, I'm not talking about myself, look, look at people, but society also. Look at our reaction uh, that we had uh, during the uh, pandemic. Uh, we hailed our heroes. We talked about how wonderful all these people were that came to rescue us, that fed us, that tended to every one of our needs, and they were overwhelmingly people of color and low-income people, and there were people who traveled by transit overwhelmingly. And what did we do? We said, if you rode transit, don't bother, bother to come to the New York Stock Exchange. The CDC sent notices to employers like myself, said, give incentives to your employees to drive alone. What about all those employees that can't afford cars, don't have cars, or can't drive for whatever reason? So as a society, we're still doing a terrible job 90% of the money, even in the New York metropolitan area, if you look at the capital budgets, they are going for highway projects, not for active transportation, not for walking, not for biking. 
it is to improve level of service. And even if a few states now don't have it as a major measure, it is ingrained in the, the minds of the highway engineers. In addition to throwing out level of service, throw out the manual of uniform traffic control devices. Uh, what a terrible document if we're trying to care about people. It forces you to have the widest lanes possible, make it the most difficult for pedestrians to cross streets, and allows for traffic to move the fastest it possibly could. So a long way to go before we see action towards equity. Lots of talk for now. Thanks, Sam. As my good friend Gary Toth, who used to be with NJDOT and is now with Project for Public Spaces, likes to say, you got religion um, <laughs> as an engineer. and You joined, joined forces with us planners. Um, Anne. Well, I just have one point to make that, you know, honestly, equity is a core value in planning. But I do want to make a pitch for health as a way of thinking about equity, because health equity is like embedded in the public health perspective. And it can, the health lens can be an important one, uh, one that sort of reaches across a lot of different societal divides. People can agree about creating a healthier environment. And so this can be another measure or lens for thinking about transportation planning and one that's very salient at the moment, just like, um, just like equity is in Black Lives Matter, but it can be another way of talking about those issues. Great, thank you, Anne. Jeffrey, I saw your face light up when she was talking about health. Did you have any one last thing to add in here on this topic? Yeah, I would just add that we really, I think we need to restructure or reframe the conversation uh, when it comes to equity and transportation. Uh, definitely, definitely access is important and, and the focus on access. Uh, as Sam mentioned, maybe even changing <laughs> our department's uh, uh, names, you know, certainly uh, from departments of transportation to uh, departments of excess. But I think fundamentally we need to go further. When we talk about access, um, I don't think it resonates the same way as it does if we go deeper and connect access to its lack participating in in balance uh, and perhaps maybe Anne's suggestion of bringing in health and health disparities um, uh, and and how that impacts us as human beings maybe that's a way of getting us there but I do believe if we want to dismantle uh, these structures and and in anti-blackness then we need to call you know, our attention to um, violence such as lack of access and, and, and exactly, you know, how uh, it leads um, to inequitable uh, environments and situations in our material world. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right, so we have one final question, which I believe I originally told you all had two minutes to answer, but we're getting tight in time and we wanna be sure we can get to audience Q&A. So you have one minute to answer uh, this last question. Um, what does New Jersey need to do from a transportation planning policy and investment, investment perspective to get where we need to be? Um, how does New Jersey become a leader in transportation planning and implementation? And I think I'd like to throw it to Harriet first as our, our original speaker and keynote. Well, um, I, I think, uh, I think uh, we've said it a lot of different ways that uh, uh, we need to measure success uh, uh, in ways that are most salient uh, to the equitability, but also honestly to the economy of Northern New Jersey. Um, and I think that, uh, that things like level of service are so antiquated and such a mismatch for the values that people have articulated um, that, um, yeah, that I think, I think uh, this is the perfect place to really look at something else. And, and while, while uh, 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 NJTPA would be uh, in the vanguard, you, you wouldn't be the very first. There are other states that are doing this, including uh, Washington State uh, and, and Virginia. Uh, but uh, but really rethinking what it is you want out of your transportation system 
and, uh, and creating those metrics and then following where those metrics lead to get you there. Thank you, Harriet. Uh, Sam, would you like to chime in? Okay, sure. Um, I, I think one of the best things that you could do is engage the engineers that are doing all the uh, design planning. Uh, you know, money is what talks the big money right now. The capital money is investing in roads and bridges and uh, less so in transit, although New Jersey did reasonably well under the CARES Act. But it, it's really rethinking uh, our whole transportation system. Transit has to be up there. Some of that capital investment that's going for roads and bridges should be diverted into transit. You know, uh, Anne talked about the health connections and, and Harriet, the economy connections. We have to make all of those things to make those arguments. I throw in the science aspect of it. It is good for the health. It is good for the economy. It is good science to invest more in people as opposed to moving vehicles faster. Great. Thank you, Sam. Jeffrey. Yeah, I'll just add uh, uh, to this conversation because I think all of it is what Sam has said, what Harriet has said in this case in, in terms of, I think, the political um, realm, what needs to happen, metrics, uh, uh, the, the additional resources. I think from, from the planner's perspective, I think we have to give some thought and give attention to how we uh, frame and articulate the recommendations that, that we're making. And some of that is because our power is really in our persuasion, I believe. And I think, you know, we do need to take more risk in terms of how we um, uh, make uh, the recommendations and, and be courageous. Uh, I think that's the only way that we're going to sway uh, the political will uh, to, to flip the script, if you will, and, and get to where we want. Great. Thank you, Jeffrey. Nat. I would like to see the state DOT put together a new state transportation plan that is ambitious for all the things that we've been talking about in terms of climate mitigation, adaptation, equity, health, um, as some of the other uh, state energy master plan, the offshore wind energy plan, um, all of these very ambitious energy, economic development, climate uh, objectives. And I think that, you know, the, 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 the state DOT should put together a plan that talks as ambitiously about how it will be a leader uh, in achieving the same kinds of administration goals. And I also think that New Jersey should just aggressively um, seek transportation leadership out of the, the city transportation um, field. Uh, I think that we should, you know, NACDO is a great resource. There's a tremendous number of talented city transportation uh, officials who've, who've led transportation departments and who have a lot of experience um, with all of the kinds of adapting all of the kinds of technologies that we've been talking about in cities. Um, and I think applying them to the suburbs would be, uh, you know, I think we need that, we need that skill set. So we should be looking for, for leaders who have the experience of city transportation and trying to bring it to our statewide transportation needs. Thank you, Nat. And Anne. Well, one of the um, sort of nirvanas of public health and, and city planning connections is the intersectoral collaboration. And people almost never pull it off, at least for any period of time. But in the sort of research on this, one of the things that can help it get pulled off is a crisis because it brings people together, helps them reflect on the capacity for change and actually gives them something of a common purpose. So there may be a way to like furthering, uh, actually everyone's comments, but particularly Nats, think about them. This is a moment where you could work across sectors um, and there may be a window now because of the, cri the multiple crises that there isn't in a normal time. Great, 
Thank you, Anne. Uh, I'm going to ask Melissa Hayes from NJTPA to unmute herself. She's been following the chat and the Q&A, uh, and then she's going to ask us some of the questions that are coming from the audience. And if you have any more questions, feel free to uh, put them in the Q&A. Melissa, go yes. ahead. Hello. Um, let me just scroll over here. So um, pretty early on, we had a question about um, trucks and, and how we accommodate trucks to negotiate a seven foot lane um, so that stores and restaurants can still get their deliveries. I think that was when we were talking about, um, you know, creating more access for everybody to use the, the roads. Okay. I see Ann nodding. That that's a Sam question. He did. Oh, okay. That's what I thought. <laughs> Okay. Well, thank you. Um, yes, I think the answer to how you deal with uh, the competition for space, particularly in uh, within the cities for trucking, for restaurants, for uh, other uses of the curb space is partially temporarily. Uh, trucking activity really peaks in, in the morning. It's it could be gone by 11 a.m. and the restaurants could take over the exact same space that was used for the truckers, a number of trucking associations are now looking into reservation systems, which could also work on it. Um, there's been little or no technology when it comes to the use of curb space other than some sophisticated parking meters. That's a, a real opportunity. So uh, I think we could solve it temporarily and with technology. I think that's a great point, Sam. You know, I went to Quebec last summer when we could actually go places and Canada allowed us over their borders. And they, you know, the one street at the, you know, in the heart of the historic district is closed down basically from 11 until, I don't know, midnight. And all that you go there in the morning and there's just trucks doing all their deliveries until that 11 a.m. slot. And it's just not something we, for whatever reason, seem to be doing here, um, but others have it. Do I, does anyone else want to chime in or do we want to move to the next question? Yeah, Sam's the expert on that. Go ahead, Melissa. So the next question is also about trucks, and I think maybe you addressed a little bit a bit about this. And um, you know, I, I don't know that anyone can answer part of this question, but it was, um, what is the percentage of local and long haul truck traffic on the roads in New Jersey? I don't know if anyone knows that off the top of their head. Um, and how can we minimize their effect on our roads? Um, and then they um, mentioned um, some of the things that you just talked about: Sam, delivery at night, off hours, um, and this person said the more trucks in the roads, the more accidents occur. And then our first questioner responded that accidents for trucks are actually lower than cars. Um, but I guess maybe um, this person is asking, how can we minimize the effects of, of trucks on our roads? I think they're talking about the physical infrastructure. So one opportunity that I'm, I'm aware of in the New York region is the, there, there are uh, some businesses that are trying to do trans harbor shipping, which means basically uh, offloading truck containers onto barges on the New Jersey side and shipping them across and uh, breaking down the, uh, the freight into uh, ready for shipments on the New York City side um, where they can be delivered by either smaller electric uh, uh, delivery vehicles or by even by cargo bikes. And I know that um, there's exploration among some of the biggest package deliverers about how to move to cargo bikes. And I think that um, you know anything we can do to 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 to, to manage the curbs so that and, and and lanes so that those kinds of sustainable low impact distribution systems uh, can be functional and effective. We should be thinking about. Yeah, if I, I can, if I can add, during the pandemic, truck volumes are actually higher than they were pre-pandemic. It's because all of us are ordering things and even small packages. So if you want to cut down on the truck traffic, shop locally. Um, the next question, uh, Nat addressed this in the, in the comments, but I, I don't know if he wants to say it out loud, but uh, it was a question, how do you promote the importance of transportation planning when the emphasis now is on COVID and rebuilding the economy? So, I mean, my, my response in the, in the chat was that uh, it was basically to repeat something that, uh, that, that Harry had emphasized, which is that we should be identifying the, the ways that we want um, the system to perform and uh, across all the dimensions that we've been talking about and keeping our eye very much on that prize. You know, I, the way I think about it is um, 
you know, it's very easy to get distracted by technological change. Um, and by, you know, again, a point that Harriet made that, you know, that we think about um, how the how the technology change is going to affect us and or benefit us, and, and we sometimes emphasize the benefit over the detriment. Um, but I sort of think about this challenge of planning as as, as like sailing, um, where the wind is going to shift, the currents are going to shift, um, but you pick a point and you know where you want to go, and you you tack and you you know as necessary in order to adapt to the way the conditions are changing around you. But you really focused on where you're trying to get to. And never lose sight of that. Anyone else want to chime in here? I'll chime in real quick. I think um, you know I'm going to put in my put on my downtown New Jersey hat right now, and um, everything we've actually been talking about uh, about economic recovery for our small businesses has been around a shift in the use of the roads. That you know, let's take advantage of this opportunity now and people love the the these parklets or the half closed down streets or the full closed down streets for commerce and the slow streets um, which our own njdot is being reluctant to allow a lot of towns to do um, and that the roads and the ability for people to use them for active transportation recreation and public space um, is really going to be a key to the economic recovery so they are linked and, and tied I just would remind people that planning is not synonymous with not acting. Uh, it's acting, you know, effectively, strategically, inclusively. Uh, you have to have a plan to know what it is that you're trying to do. To act without planning is just, you know, frenetic, uh, you know, activity. You're not going to get anywhere. Um, the next question, Nat also answered, but maybe somebody else wants to respond to this one. Um, it was, how about reliability, expectations for reliable uh, travel times during access? And I think this has to do with let's, the, the, the comments about level of service. Yeah. Stan, sure go ahead. No, I'm not sure if they're talking about- Can you repeat it? Yeah. Sure. So it was, how about reliability? Uh, expectations for reliable travel times during access. And uh, just in case those of you who didn't see the chat, Nat responded, I think reliability is a characteristic of access. A person who can expect a reliable trip time has more access than another person with less reliable trip time. So reliability is a key metric that determines accessibility. I think certainly in transit, uh, reliability is something that can be controlled. With car traffic, it's really difficult to control reliability. Um, uh, unless we someday, 30, 40 years in the future, we have autonomous vehicles, the, it's so unpredictable. So you have greater opportunity with a well-maintained transit system to have reliability on active transportation, incredible reliability in terms of travel time. Yeah, I want to say that as we become more multimodal, that's a possibility. I'm actually a bicycle commuter because that's the most reliable way I can commute when I do commute to my office. Um, but I also think uh, Har Harriet's uh, conversation about like integrating information technologies and internet access into thinking about the transport that can also help with this reliability discussion. If you've got, if you've got good internet access, that's a reliable way of getting to a meeting or whatever. Okay, anybody else want to respond? No. Okay, um, so um, going back to the discussion about, uh, you know, sharing the roads and, and redesigning the roads to make them safer um, for, you know, all users. Uh, we had a question, how do you make sure that our roads and built infrastructure can maintain emergency service vehicles, fire, ambulance, emergency evacuations? You know, that, that's always, uh, you know, thrown out uh, as if emergency vehicles can't get through a uh, narrower roadway. So you have to have the widest roadways possible. It has not been a problem on even the narrowest streets, the European laid out streets of the Dutch in lower Manhattan, where we have great reliability in terms of emergency services. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the placement of, of emergency vehicles. Of course, by the World Trade Center, we have a firehouse across the street. So there, there are, are creative ways of doing it. In European cities, 
the narrowest, absolutely narrowest of roadways mixed with pedestrians and emergency vehicles can respond. It is not an obstacle. Can I just point out how strange it is to, uh, you know, to take a depreciating durable good uh, that you can change, you have specs that you could say, this is the size vehicle I need and, and remaking our infrastructure in order to fit the vehicle instead of the other way around. Why aren't we procuring as they do in other countries, the vehicles that are appropriate for the cities we wanna live in instead of saying, oh, sorry, we have no choice but to have you know, grossly wide lanes because we just bought this huge vehicle. I mean, I, when I was on the transit board in, in, uh, in uh, well, actually before I got on the transit board in DC, I found out that uh, our, our transit agency had procured a bus with mirrors that extended out over 12 feet, right? Uh, and they said, well, you, they, I actually got a letter as planning director saying I had to change the lane width of my streets. And I said, yeah, you know, uh, pound sand on that one. We're not doing that. And how on earth would you have ever procured a bus, the most highly traffic area of the city? You know, we can't, we can't move the buildings to expand the lanes. So let's buy the infrastructure. Uh, sorry, let's buy the vehicles that fit our infrastructure, not the other way around. Um, uh, we have a lot of statements in here, but I'm going to skip ahead to the question. Um, what are the impacts of e-bike and scooters on traffic and safety? Um, this person mentions often they drive reverse direction and cross zigzag and quick movements, interrupting pedestrians and other vehicles. Uh, if transportation industry encourages the modes, what things should be done for safe roads? And I wasn't sure what the middle part of that was. I think they're saying that people on e-bikes and scooters are, um, taking over the pedestrian space and the vehicle space. So it's a safety concern. Um, they don't have their own space and maybe they're not used to operating these vehicles. So they're riding the wrong direction or cutting people off. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, and I kind of referred to it uh, earlier. We have this attitude that it's unsafe because of the fact we've given up so much street space to these vehicles that two tons and, or more that move quite swiftly. And uh, then we just have very narrow spaces for pedestrians. Maybe we could squeeze a little bike lane in there. And now we have so many different modes. We've, we've got to start accommodating all of these modes because these, each of these modes is a person. Whereas you have uh, a huge vehicle with one person in it. And we say that that vehicle can move at 30 or 40 miles an hour. And we will give them a 12 foot wide lane but we're going to make this this other other vehicle that move, also moves one person. Uh, we're not even going to give it its own lane and make it perhaps share it with cars or share it with bikes. We have to rethink our space based on people. And if you do that, then suddenly you will have the room to do it. And your cars will go more slowly. And that's not a problem in urban areas. And I just want to I just want to jump on that point because it applies not just with active transportation but with buses as well. And you really have to think about who you're giving space to, and not just who you're giving space to, but who you're giving time to. And I you know I just think a lot about the intersection, uh, the I eighty off ramp, and uh, at Broad Street in in Newark, where you know in the peak hour uh, the signal timing allows the the highway off ramp to clear, but you have enormous congestion on Broad Street and, you know, six, eight buses stacked up um, in traffic that's waiting. And the, and the signal time is that that's a conscious choice about who you're giving time to and whose movement you're prioritizing. And, um, you know, when you see that bus travel times uh, increase by, you know, up to 40, 60% compared to when they get free flow. Uh, when cars start being introduced to an environment, it's a real, you know, it's, 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 um, you know, it, it's a question that needs to be asked. Who is the time being given to? What mode are we prioritizing? And who are the people to whom the time is being given? If I could uh, channel my inner Don Shoup here for a second. We give so much of our roadway over to parking. And I'm just going to speak experientially here. Now that we have protected bike lanes in Jersey City, that you know we gave up some parking for, I feel safe biking. I did not have a city bike membership until we put those protected bike lanes in. 
And so we exchanged that parking, but now you have more people. How many people can you get down that bike lane versus the 10, 15 cars that are just sitting there for free, you know? So, and Anne, I think you, you want to add to that? Well, you know, as someone who turned from a non-cyclist to a middle-aged commuter cyclist, right, I've sort of been through this whole experience. And I want to say as more people do non-motorized modes, you have to think of them as not one thing. Um, because um, one of the, you know, there will be increasing conflicts between different kind of cyclists. So you can't just imagine that they're all like Courtney, who's just managed to get on a bike in a protected bike lane and go along. And they're not all like the Lycra guys, right? Who were like, oh, straight past you. Um, but, you know, you have to deal with that diversity. So it becomes more of a, of a design challenge. So it's not just giving sort of one group a bit more space. It's actually a big design challenge. And I'm saying it's worth it because, you know, bikes take up less space. It's good for the environment. It's good for us and so on. But um, I, I do want to say that you don't, I, I, it's a real issue to think about the complexity of managing for multiple modes. And it isn't just one simple solution. It may require some redundant infrastructure. There's a lot of redundant infrastructure for cars at the moment. So, it, you know, fair enough for there to be some redundant infrastructure for cycling on PEDs and so on. Um, so with that, we are at 1057 and we promised to keep, get people off um, by uh, uh, 11 o'clock. So I thank you to all of our panelists um, for a great contribution um, to this discussion. I, I, I've seen good comments and people seem to really appreciate it. I'm going to real quick share my screen. Um, for those of you who uh, will be joining us for networking and further discussion, again, uh, here's the link and uh, Christina, I believe, is going to put that also in the uh, chat. And then also this is approved for AICP CM credits. Uh, Christina is also putting that link in there if you want to claim uh, your credits. Um, so with that, I'm just going to um, share it over to Ted to uh, close us out. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Courtney. Um, I appreciate it. And uh, hats off, you know what, to Harriet, James, Anne, Sam, Nat, and uh, for just a really thought-provoking look at the realities and challenges of adapting to change. For me, one of the key takeaways here today has been that we don't have to accept the way we've always done things. I think the question will be whether there's the political will and the policy will, I guess, for lack of a better uh, term, to make the changes long-term that we need to, to kind of remake um, the same thing that it's been for 50 plus years. It'll be interesting to see, and hopefully we can incorporate this, these ideas into our long range plan. Uh, as I mentioned at the top of the program, uh, today's symposium is gonna be actually uh, part of a series of three. So two more will follow in our TPA Tuesday series. So stay tuned, we're gonna keep you uh, posted uh, once we finalize the details on that. And if you haven't already done so, why not join us for one of our next two Plan 2050 virtual public workshops? Mary Amin mentioned them at the uh, beginning of the program. We have one tomorrow morning from eight to nine, and then another Thursday night from seven to eight. These are virtual public workshops that, um, that we love to have you, your ideas, on transportation-oriented change, what's changed over the years, what we'd like to see change going forward, and also you know, what we'd like to continue or expand if it's working well now. Think about the open streets and, and the shared public spaces that we're seeing now during the pandemic in so many towns. Maybe that's something that's, that's, that, that's, that we don't wanna see go away once this pandemic finally reaches, uh, reaches its welcomed end. Um, so if you haven't already uh, yet taken our super quick plan 2050 survey, it takes less than five minutes, if that, uh, please do so. And then once you do, share widely with your friends, your family, and your contacts here in North Jersey. We'd appreciate it. Just be sure to follow us on social. Hit us up at njtpa.org slash plan 2050 and help us develop a vision for North Jersey's transportation future. Thanks again for being with us today. Hope you have an awesome day and hope you can join us for the networking and discussion after. Thank you.